was a test series full of drama, despair and triumph for the England team and its captain. Reflections and unique moments from the recent Caribbean tour, now on BBC Two, introduced by Jonathan Agnew. quite sure how these things are going to go you hope you've made some sound choices in selection and you hope you know the people that you've selected will will play for you uh, but you're never quite sure what will happen the west indies is traditionally the most difficult tour of all and mike atherton who is leading his country abroad for the first time faced a colossal challenge he responded radically dispensing with the old guard the captain put his faith in a team of young and inexperienced players who he hoped would transform England's fortunes after another disastrous year. On the face of it, a 3-1 defeat suggests that his plan backfired. But despite the result, Atherton has now returned home amidst a feeling of genuine optimism. Already barely three weeks after the final ball was bowled in Antigua, there's another international series just around the corner. But the historic events in the Caribbean will linger long in the memory. I've enjoyed myself, I've thoroughly enjoyed um, playing in the West Indies, you know, the enthusiasm of the crowds, um, the general no knowledge of cricket and, and enthusiasm rubs off on you, so I've thoroughly enjoyed that, that part of it. I remain convinced that we made the right step in bringing this side and I don't believe that, you know, players who were left behind would have made uh, a lot of difference to the results. Uh, and certainly at the time of selection, you know, 95% of people were behind us and, and felt that, you know, we brought about the best side we could. Not everyone will agree with that, and I felt very strongly that David Gower, who's now been consigned to the press box, should have been included. But Gower too would concede that overall, the tour was a resounding personal triumph for the young captain. Here is the time. I think he's been most impressive in everything he's done. As a captain, one can hardly have a more difficult start. He came out almost intolerably burdened for, for such a young man, such an inexperienced captain. He's handled it all very confidently. He's been very straightforward with the media. He's been very commanding on the field. And the players clearly, although he's still very inexperienced, um, have a, a tremendous respect for him. Overseas tours are always hampered by injury problems. And this one was no exception, as England lost their most reliable bowler for two weeks. One definite advantage of being captain is that you pick the team. The opening one-day international in Barbados was Atherton's first for nearly three years, and he made up for lost time, making 86 out of England's 202. Meanwhile, rumours of discontent within the West Indian camp were rife. The captain, Richie Richardson, missed practice, and some players had refused to get off their aircraft when it arrived in Barbados because of a row over match fees. It was a shambolic West Indian performance, but England went on to win only their second one-day international in the Caribbean. Hopes were high as the Man of the Match award went to Captain Calypso. Another early start and another airport departure lounge. This is the side to touring which the public doesn't always see and it's the one which can quickly wear the players down. One day in every week of this tour was spent on the move, shaking hands, looking for lost bags and battling through customs and immigration. All the time, Mike Atherton was aware that the eyes of the cricketing world were focused on his team. This flight was particularly tense. Destination, Jamaica, and the vital first test. 
Atherton decided to put himself in the firing line and bat first on a pitch which looked more like an ice rink and seemed tailor-made for the West Indian fast bowlers. But for the second time in four days, England, largely thanks to Alex Stewart's 70, looked to be on top. However, as regular followers know only too well, when England's batting collapses, it does so in style. 350 is a minimum first inning score on a good batting track like that, and you're thinking 400 puts you in with a good chance of applying some pressure. Um, but you know, you must always tell yourself at the back of mind, if you're 121 for none, if you just had two wickets mentally, you know, the situation doesn't quite look so rosy. And that's what happened, we lost wickets in clusters, uh, we got to 170 for three, and then lost three quick wickets again. And there were a few too many um, sloppy shots, too many easy wickets really for test match cricket. From 121 without loss, England were all out for 234. The West Indies were quickly 23 for three, but a certain Brian Lara was waiting in the wings. Well, I played against him um, six years ago when we were both 19 in the Youth World Cup. And I was captain of England, he was captain of the West Indies. So, but, but in between that, I haven't seen very much of him, but I, I realise he's a, a highly talented player. And in fact, I hadn't seen too much of all the left-handers, Arthurton and Adams as well, who both played very well. The left-handed trio of Lara, Arthurton and Adams snatched the game away from Mike Atherton as the West Indies built up a commanding lead. There was little warning of what was to follow, which proved to be one of the more controversial moments of the tour. We've had three months of preparation and I knew exactly what coming to the West Indies was all about and up till then, apart from perhaps against the Leeward Islands in Antigua, we'd not seen too much hostile bowling. When Monday night came about and Courtney slipped himself into his 14 over spell, it was, it was what Test Cricket's all about in the West Indies. I've no complaints that as a top six batter, I must have the courage and the technique to handle it, and I was very happy uh, to do that. You won't find any of our top six batsmen complaining about that. It was a ferocious onslaught, but rather surprisingly, there did appear to be a moment of light relief. Well, he hit me the ball before, um, and I'd sworn that basically at myself for taking my eye off the ball, and I think he got a bit upset thinking I was swearing at him, so I was just uh, politely pointing out I wasn't. <laughs> Had Atherton survived just one more ball, Walsh would have been out of the attack. Part of the West Indian game plan is to deliberately target the opposing captain, and they knew the psychological effect his dismissal would have on his teammates. It had been a thorough examination of his technique, not to mention his bravery, and Atherton knew there were still two months and four tests to go. Enjoyment's probably the wrong word. Um, I, I got into it in that session. I was quite enjoying it. I was quite relishing the challenge. You know, there was a game to be saved from our point of view. Um, and Courtney, who's a high-class fast bowler, was bowling as well as he can. Um, so, from a cricketing point of view, it's a very challenging time. Uh, I was just sorry I wasn't quite up to it in the end. Two hours later, and the England captain socialises with the opposition at yet another cocktail party. It's a testimony to international cricket that the players will freely mix after play. But as Devon Malcolm discovered, hostilities were immediately resumed in the morning when Welsh's barrage prompted banner headlines and criticism of the independent umpire from Zimbabwe. The viewing was fairly plain for everybody to see and the intent was there. Um, no more needs to be said. Welshie was bowling at a length that um, was just uh, bouncing above the stumps and he was taking his eyes off the ball and I think that when you do that you're going to be in trouble. I think regardless of whether you're batting at 1 or 11, you've always got to watch the ball. Maybe Alex Stewart should have watched the ball a little more closely. His run out prompting England's second innings decline to 155 for 6 as England's hopes of saving the first test all but evaporated. Yeah! He's gone, he's got behind. through Graham Thorpe. Graham Hick was regarded by many as a risky choice for the tour because of his poor record against fast bowling. Atherton publicly backed him last year against Australia and now when the chips were down, Hick repaid him for that vote of confidence. He battled his way to 96 before facing this delivery from Kenneth Benjamin. That's in the air, he's gone. Brilliant catch by Harper at second slip. So it's not to be. 
Hicks' dismissal ensured that there wouldn't be a repeat of England's heroics here four years ago when Graham Gooch's team pulled off a remarkable victory. The first test match of any tour is vitally important, but this one seemed to be even more so because of the inexperience of the England team and the fact that the West Indies are usually slow starters. The West Indies completed their eight-wicket win in a deserted Sabina Park off only 32 balls on the final day. And while England may not have impressed everyone on the field, they're at least proving to be a hit off it. They're friendly. They're going friendly night. Especially like um, people like Graham Thor, Alex Stewart, nice um, Jack Russell. The skipper is OK. There was more bad news when, out of the blue, Devon Malcolm was flown home for knee surgery. I felt they should have called up a replacement, but they didn't. Malcolm returned later, but wasn't considered fit enough for the tests. You tend to learn lessons the hard way in the Caribbean. I mean, I was batting on Monday night, but they tell me that the dressing room was very quiet and silent on Monday watching it. That's what test cricket's all about in the West Indies, and, and for people who haven't been here before, um, they know that now, and they must steal themselves uh, against what's to come. Such is the passion for one-day cricket in the West Indies that just 48 hours later, the crowds were queuing up outside Sabina Park three hours before the start of the second international. Once again, England's batting let them down as they lost four wickets for two runs in ten balls, and Richie Richardson's men breezed to victory with more than an over to spare. Mike Atherton arrived in St Vincent for the third one-day international at the beautiful Arnus Vale cricket ground under mounting pressure. Being the captain of a losing team on tour is a lonely job, and off-duty, Atherton was often to be seen on his own, wrestling with the problems of team selection and tactics. At least he was never short of advice from the cricket-crazy locals. When you win tomorrow, when you go back home, you could say, these two guys were yeah. selling me. Yeah. They told me, they told me the bat first. Yeah, it's a tricky place, man. Yeah. Explain to them why I've got a bat yeah. first. Yeah. Explain to the camera why yeah, I've got well, a bat Yeah, um, well, because the ground, really the ground really um, will be more stirring it on the, on the afternoon. You understand? Yeah. The side is going to get high, <laughs> and the park is going to be real serious. So it was decided well in advance. If England won the toss, they would bat first. It is a coat of arms. Uh, you can have a bat. Oh, thank you. Goodness knows who talked Mike Atherton into changing his mind, but the West Indies batsman promptly tore England's bowling to shreds. It was a poor performance all round. Um, I think partly I was at fault for um, sticking the West Indies in on what turned out to be a good, good wicket to bat first on, so I'd take part blame for that. Uh, but to be fair, I think the way we bowled in particular, it wouldn't have made much difference had we bowled first or second. Richie Richardson clobbered 52 off only 27 balls as his team made 313 for six, their highest ever one-day score against England, who proceeded to lose by 165 runs. Well, he can't say he wasn't warned, and now, after three consecutive defeats, England's morale was sagging. Well, it's pretty low, as you, you, you'd expect that. Um, I was certainly pretty embarrassed. Um, I was batting at the end, and it was uh, a feeling, you know, that you don't really want to have too often when you're playing for England. The home of Calypso seemed to be an ideal place for England's bowlers to rediscover their lost rhythm. I'm quite happy to let my emotions show on the field, and if people are bowling badly, to let them know so. Um, I'm not really one for a massive dressing down in private. Uh, um, we tried to get the bowlers together and, as I say, remind them of the basics of one-day cricket. You, know, you keep drumming them into them and hope that they take notice and produce the good. But Atherton's words went unheeded. Desmond Haynes leading the way in the first of the final weekend of internationals by scoring a century as the West Indies took the series. It seemed now that England were down and out, but in the rain-affected final match, Alex Stewart gave the first hint that Atherton's young team might be capable of fighting back when all seemed lost. Meanwhile at Lords, Ray Illingworth was elected chairman of selectors and spoke of making changes. Many feel that the manager's position is under threat. I've known Illy for 30 odd years. You know, I, was, I played under him in 71 when England last won. Well, I don't know whether we last won the Ashes, but we certainly won the Ashes over in Australia then. And he was captain, so our, our actual thoughts on cricket are very, very similar. You know, we both think the same way about cricket. Uh, what we've got to do, obviously, is pull our thoughts and pull our knowledge together to try and get the best out of what we've got. 
Next stop, the South American continent and a rare day off. But back home, the demand for that back page photograph is as keen as ever. The management had a course in media relations before they left England. It's not something I especially enjoy, but it's kind of regarded as an ever-increasing part of this job. Um, so you just get on with it. Um, you know, there's ever-increasing numbers of journalists and photographers who come with us these days on tours. So uh, if you're struggling to come to terms with it, you're knackered, really. The hardest thing I've found is to keep all members of the touring party happy, um, particularly on an itinerary like this where there's not so much cricket outside the internationals and we've got 17 players, it means six players are not playing cricket uh, and they're all players who you think are good players because you picked them in the first place and you're all happy for them to play but at the end of the day you can only pick 11 and you have to make a, a judgement and sometimes that judgement is just an instinctive thing and it's very difficult to explain to players why they're not playing uh, and that's what I've found the hardest thing so far. This is the most important part of the tour for me um, because if we can get back into it in either Guyana or Trinidad that will give us a lift for the last two games but obviously if we don't do so well in these two and we're going to where the West Indies are traditionally strong in Barbados and Antigua it's going to be very difficult to, to kind of pull it back there um, so naturally I hope that we play well here and Trinidad's a result wicket and anything could happen there. Those fateful words would come back to haunt him. But for now, before the second test, there were mounting worries about the form of England's most experienced batsman, Robin Smith. He rediscovered his touch, making 84, as he and Atherton put on 171 after England had been in terrible trouble at two for two. Atherton led the way with 144. I'm the type of person who plays better, and I don't think so much about my batting. In the past, when you've not got the worries of captaincy, it's easy to get too focused on your own game and start worrying too much about your own form and perhaps the other responsibilities that were there with captaincy meant that really I just went out and batted uh, without thinking too much about it and I find that helped and also as a captain you feel a responsibility for your own team and perhaps that increases the levels of your performance. It was Atherton's most significant innings for England so far. Much of the media attention before the match had been focused on Mark Rambrakash. He had been called in to play his first test match overseas, filling the unenviable number three position in the country of his father's birth. Rambrakash was keen to see as much of Guyana as he could. It was a very emotional moment for me because um, I still have family here in Guyana. And, uh, you know, my father left over 30 years ago to come to England. And uh, for us to be back here, well, for my father to be back here watching me play, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to explain, really. It just means a hell of a lot. Sadly, there was a sting in the tail as Rambrakash fell to his sixth ball for just two. Great disappointment for Rambrakash Sr., but it wasn't such a wasted trip for Chris Lewis's family. They had travelled from London to watch the enigmatic England all-rounder return to the country of his birth. Brilliant catch, Chris Lewis. Meanwhile, England's bowlers were still struggling to adapt to the West Indian conditions. Jeff Arnold, the specialist coach who had just been sacked from his position at Surrey, was flown in to rectify the problem. Having a fully equipped television studio on site was a tremendous help as the players were able to see their faults for themselves and Angus Fraser would eventually take full advantage of Arnold's advice and the modern technology. You, in the West Indies, I think you have to learn the bowler line. It is so important. I mean, that is the difference between Ambrose and all the other fast bowlers in the world. You have to play every time. And, um, you know, then suddenly he uses his height, his rhythm, and the ball kicks from a good length and he gets another wicket. I think that's what you have to do. You have to learn to bowl a line, slip the ball, stop pounding it on an innocuous surface. Torrential rain has ruined Guyana's reputation as a test venue, but the enthusiasm amongst the locals hasn't been dampened. Brian Lara gave them a memorable exhibition of his very special talent, making 167, as once again the West Indian batsman took control. Jimmy Adams, who had been stranded on 95 in Jamaica, managed to complete his first test century and give Nottinghamshire's supporters something to look forward to this summer. Test selection is a ticklish subject in the Caribbean, where the many countries fiercely campaign for their own cricketers. 
Shivnarine Chanderpol's family turned out in force to support the 19-year-old, whose selection had prompted accusations of tokenism. Well, it's a nice time to come into a side when they're winning, uh, when they've got plenty of confident players around them, and when you know he's in fairly good form himself. Um, it's in stark contrast to the situations that some of the England players at a young age find themselves coming in. Uh, but there's nothing you can do about that. You have to bring young players in sometimes, and if the side isn't winning, um, they have to come in in a losing situation and take it upon themselves to try and turn that round. Chanderpaul made 62, while his opposing captain on the recent under-19 tour of England didn't play one first-class match last summer. The West Indies lead by 234. And bold it is. And that's his 200th test wicket. After his century in the first innings, Atherton's fourth ball duck put the skids under his team as Kirtley Ambrose sniffed the chance of victory. Robin Smith was also unable to repeat his heroics of the first day. When it was wrapped up by Courtney Walsh, the West Indies had won by an innings and 44 runs to go two up in the series with three still to play. <laughs> Now, gentlemen, we are proud and glad to have the English team down to Trinidad. We are always pleased to have a good team like them in the West Indies. So let me put you right in the clip. It's England who taught us to play cricket. So the boys are always glad to have a teacher with us down to Trinidad. The Trinidad test was the most remarkable match I've ever seen and right from the outset England appeared to be doing their best to throw it away. Strength of character and the ability to respond under pressure are essential qualities of a successful test cricketer and the young captain was making mental notes. He's bowled him like some. Yeah, it's a finding out time both for me in terms of captaining and in terms of finding out about the other players because you often pick players and if they're not in your county side you know how they play because you've seen them in games but you don't know very much about them sometimes and you're really taking a bit of punt on, on their character and their bottle that kind of thing and it's only really when you play with them on a tour such as this that you really find out about them a number of atherton's young lions were now beginning to suggest that they possess the fighting qualities their captain was looking for graham thorpe's technique had been strongly criticized in jamaica and he had failed twice in guyana prompting calls for him to be dropped but now his gritty, determined innings of 86 made in four hours, giving him a valuable lead of 76. Like Mark Rambrakash, Ian Salisbury had spent much of the trip sitting on the sidelines, but Mike Atherton always believed that sometime on the tour, Salisbury would make a vital contribution. In Trinidad, he did just that through one moment of inspiration in the field. That's brilliantly taken. Superb catch. And then, with an outrageous stroke of luck, he took the wicket, which surely meant that England would win the match. A full top. Oh, it's unbelievable. He's been caught off Robin Smith. Adams crashed the full toss into Smith at short leg. It was a complete fluke. Robin Smith sustained nothing more than a nasty bruise. And England's cricketers were able to bask in glory, confident that they would keep the Test Series alive. Credit for that must go to Andy Caddick. Hi, man. Injuries and then a loss of confidence had wrecked the start of his tour, but he took six wickets in a test for the first time. Oh, yes. Andrew Caddick, a brilliant return catch. And Richie Richardson is gone. That's it. Taken by Russell behind the stumps. Ambrose out with the West Indies 171 runs ahead, but this moment, earlier in the morning, will haunt Graham Hick for the rest of his days. Chanderpol had only five and went on to make 50, every run making England's task more difficult. It was very frustrating. Um, everybody was aware that that was a crucial opportunity missed. And it's frustrating because really, you know, he's one of the finest slip fielders around who muffed a fairly simple chance. And, you know, there's nothing, not a hell of a lot you can do about it. Um, and so, yeah, you're frustrated. The mood within the camp had been one of quiet optimism. England needed 194 runs to win the match and stay in the series. No one was prepared for what was to follow. Yeah, I feel all right today.
padding up with an hour to go, it was obvious the West Indies were going to come steaming in for that hour, and I was just trying to tell everybody to be positive. Thank you for making me well. No. They had us down, but um, we were out, and, you know, we, we got up and we, we threw a big punch. Oh, that's very close first ball. I think it was a pretty good decision to get first up, obviously, fairly out. Um, that's just one of those things. I don't think I played it especially bad. It was just unlucky. First runs for England. Oh, the trouble here, trouble. This is absolute disaster for England. Kirtle is a, a much better bowler when he's either going to bat to the wall or whether he's when his senses are kind of breakthrough and he obviously sniffed an opportunity there. That gave him a lift and the other players around him. Uh, obviously it has a psychologically down effect on, on the England dressing room. But you know, you hope that players are strong enough for the technique and temperament to come through that. And on that occasion we won. Curly Ambrose knows it's out. With the, 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 the pheasant English players, and for quite some time, they put their front foot away down and then they can't get it back. You know, so I would think that they'll have to look at their technique. They'll, the coaches will have to start looking at the players and try and start teaching them line and length and to move initiatively, particularly to the real quicks, back. That's gone. Six out. An unbelievable collapse here. That's gone. Simmons takes the catch a second slip. when the wickets were tumbling, it must have been chaos in there. Um, I don't know, I'm sat in the shower, just hearing the roars. <laughs> we went to Taunton chasing 70 and were 15 for 7, so cricket throws up these anomalies, but usually test cricket you find an international side is strong enough uh, to come through these things, but we weren't last night. And that's in the air, Benjamin down there for it, the match is over, the West Indies have won. Last night, an hour and a half was one of the most dramatic and exciting parts of a test match that I've ever seen. After a disastrous year, English cricket had hit rock bottom. They'd avoided equaling their lowest ever score in test cricket by just a single run. A blackwash was now a serious possibility. Last test match cricket, it tends to throw up, you know, um, shifts in the balance of power during the five days. That's what makes test cricket such a great game. And for three days, we controlled the match uh, and got blown away in an hour on the fourth. But what has happened with England is that they'll come up against a New Zealand team, particularly in the one that which Richard Headley is not in now, and they'll be able to get back on that front foot, stick the front foot down there, play around it, make runs, and they'll go ahead thinking that everything is all right. But it's not, because... Again, when they come against the real quicks, they're going, to be, they're going to be caught out again. As far as the whole structure of the game, yes, I do think radical rethinking is required. Uh, somewhere, England lose their way between the ages of about 9 and 24, when young players don't mature as quickly as the Chandler Pauls of this world. Uh, there was a young England player called Matthew Diamond who got a double hundred in the under-19 series, just as Chandler Paul did. He'll probably spend the summer playing for Nottinghamshire second eleven. That's not good enough. There's a lot of poor county cricket. There's a lot of soft cricket played in England. You know, it is a social game. And unfortunately, I don't mean a social game so much at, at county level, but it is a very much a social game as far as British cricket, club cricket, and it tends to go spread through a little bit into county cricket. Now, our cricket isn't as tough as what the cricket over here is, or in Australia or South Africa. Mike Atherton's tour, which he had looked forward to with so much optimism just two months ago, now lay in tatters. The harsh reality of his new position must have hit him hard. Even his private life was splashed across the front pages. Very difficult to accept. I think you do accept that it's happened to other people, therefore it's likely to happen to you. Um, but certainly as a single bloke who's not married, I didn't think it had a hell of a lot to do with the Sunday papers. Um, but, you know, you... You let these things get on top of you. Um, it's time to pack it in. 
All the signs in Barbados suggested humiliation. England had just been thrashed by a West Indian border leavening in Grenada, and the West Indies hadn't been beaten at the Kensington Oval for 59 years. I think personally it's a great opportunity to break the mould, make some history. You know, the West Indies have got a very strong record here. Now that record's got to come to an end sometime. It'd be nice if, if we brought it to an end. Fighting talk, but no one seriously believed that this England team would even get out of the stalls. It's now 40 years since Barbados's favourite son, Sir Garfield Sobers, first played for the West Indies. The island was already in festive mood with the celebrations coming to a head during the fourth test match. None of the great test players who had gathered to honour Sir Gary had ever seen the West Indies lose here. I said we're going to whoop you. Real bad. For the locals, defeat wasn't even a remote possibility. Motivational side of things shouldn't be a problem. Um, we've got a big travelling support here. People are obviously playing for their test futures with a new chairman of selectors being installed in April. Um, so from the motivation point of view, that shouldn't be a problem. It looked more like the Kennington Oval than the Kensington Oval. Over 5,000 English fans combined a holiday on the beach with the test match. And the ovation they gave England's batsmen, Mike Atherton and Alex Stewart, seemed to have the desired effect. Their first task was to bury the ghost of Trinidad once and for all. Atherton is absolutely perfect in his technique. Stewart um, hits a little bit across the ball. But I think that Alex Stewart is about your best player to fix, to real quick, because he moves back and across and take a look. And that's how you have to play real quick. You've got to move back and across, take a look, and then decide which way you're going from there. But if you get out there and stick your big front foot right down the wicket, then you've committed yourself. And when you're playing against bowlers like Courtney Ambrose, you don't have much time to adjust. Spurred on by the tremendous support, Mike Atherton and Alex Stewart put on 171, their highest partnership of the tour. That's it. Alex Stewart's got his 100. Kensington rising to him. Not a bad way to celebrate your 31st birthday, but once again, England's batsmen failed to build on that start. Robin Smith made 10 before the arch tormentor Kirtley Ambrose blew the tail away. What Mike Atherton would give for an Ambrose of his own. A captain's job is difficult enough in the field, and throughout the tour, the form of England's bowlers had added to his problems. At last, things were about to change. It's gone on the edge, and it's easily taken by Atherton. That third slip, and Richie Richardson's gone. Oh, that's through. He's got him. Jack Russell takes the catch this time. It's nice to do well, uh, bowl well, and to get the, the, the edges. It's some days you walk off the field having felt you bowl well and not got the edges, but it was nice that they did today. Angus Fraser, around whom Atherton's attack had been built, took 8 for 75, the best ever bowling figures by an Englishman against the West Indies, and proved beyond doubt that he's back to his best after an injury which seriously threatened his career three years ago. To Graham Hick, at least, Trinidad seemed a million miles away. It's away and out. High in the air again, Tufnell's underneath it. And he's taken the catch. England had a lead of 51, but there had been another blemish in the field, and again it was Chanderpole who was let off the hook. However, the writing was on the wall as far as the locals were concerned. Their proud record was now under threat. record and an outstanding achievement. Alex Stewart added 143 to his 118 in the first innings 
to become the first Englishman ever to score a century in each innings against the West Indies. Graham Thorpe continued his progression with 84 and Graham Hick made 59 when Mike Atherton declared. The realisation had now dawned in all of us that England really could achieve what had seemed to be an impossible dream. The West Indies needed 446 to win, or more realistically, to bat for over a day to save the match. He's out. The West Indies have lost the wicket. Jimmy Adams goes and Carrick makes the breakthrough. Graham Hick takes the catch. I mean, I'd not, not really said much to the players. I, I always felt that they were a group of people who wouldn't get too down if things went bad. We obviously bear these things in mind when you select the side. And I felt that there were some quite strong characters in the team. And I felt that with it being uh, young lads who've got test careers to make, I felt even if things went badly, they would all be, be trying to improve their game, work hard at their game. And so it proved. Yeah! Got him! Success for Phil Tufnell. That's what he's been waiting for all day. The way the crowd kind of behaved, they behaved brilliantly. It was fantastic. As there were two or three wickets to fall on the evening, uh, I think everybody realised what was about to happen. So uh, at the actual moment, I think, you know, it, it was kind of sinking in well before that. It's in the air and he's gone this time. Rampakash makes no mistake. And another five wicket haul for Andrew Caddick. Gone high in the air, Alex Stewart's the man underneath it, and takes the catch, and isn't he pleased about that? The eighth wicket goes down. He's gone, Haynes out to Tufnell, West Indies have lost their ninth wicket. When the last wicket was about to fall, it was very difficult to keep your concentration because all the English crowd were kind of milling onto the outfield and knew we were about to kind of make it happen. And then when it did happen, everybody rushed on and it was all a bit of a blur. And, you know, it was that kind of crazy half hour. And that's it. All over. England have won. great because you know we've been through some tough times and lost three test matches um had had some tough hours particularly the one at trinidad so to come back from that i think everybody was quite proud of what we achieved you know showed a great deal of character and resilience um uh, it's just a great feeling and when you've got that kind of team spirit and togetherness it's, it's a nice time beats the hell out of losing uh, scenes in the dressing room afterwards were, were nice scenes we were as focused as we should be um, we, we didn't bat as well as we should have. We bowled quite a few no balls and that really set us back. And um, England capitalised on that. England's remarkable performance transformed the mood of the tour virtually overnight. From the depths of despair, a feeling of euphoria overcame all of us who were lucky enough to be able to say, I was there. The demand for photographs is as intense as ever, with the press corps still desperate for that special picture to record the moment of history, and the captain's more than happy to oblige. With the tour now into its fourth month, it was important for England's cricketers to be able to unwind at every opportunity. There were just two days off between the fourth and fifth test matches, as the local tourist industry cashed in on England's travelling supporters. It feels like day 90 at the moment. Uh, you know, these test matches, when they're back-to-back, -back, are very um, hard work, particularly for the fast bowlers um, and for the batsmen, kind of more the mental drain. Um, but, you know, we knew the itinerary uh, before we came out here. Um, it was just a matter of trying to be strong and get through it. Andrew, look for Mummy. Another welcome distraction was the arrival of many of the players' young families. 
The demands on a top international cricketer's time are so great that they're seldom at home. Opportunities such as this mean a great deal. I think it gives uh, most people a bit of a lift. Uh, it's nice to see them. I think most of them have come out for Barbados and Antigua, so it's at the end of the trip, so they've been away from them quite a while. So it's nice to see them here, and they bring a kind of fresh atmosphere to things. Just for a change, it was the West Indies who had the problems before the final test. Richie Richardson had pulled a hamstring, and the experienced Desmond Haynes was also ruled out. The second string openers were dismissed quickly, giving Brian Lara the chance of more time at the crease. But even he wasn't fully fit, he needs an eye operation. You know, a lot of uh, guys who play whatever sport in the sun do suffer from it, and um, it's not a major problem. So it does not affect me all the time. If the sun is very bright, it, it feels like if I got a stone in my eyes or something like that. All the more incredible then that Brian Lara should score 375 and break the world record. However, not even he could steal the show entirely. Antigua is gravy territory. Entry number one and the feeling all around the ground that there was more to come. I wasn't as frustrated as I had been in say Guyana where we bowled poorly because I thought we bowled well in Antigua generally uh, but the wicket was very flat he'd set his sights on a big hundred uh, and it's the biggest compliment to him to say it looked also inevitable at the time people might find that a strange thing to say from a captain of the field inside um, but we did our best, we tried to get him out and he just, there's times when you have to realise you're in the hands of a, a greater force and it was his two days. Sir Garfield Sobers watched on from the pavilion. His record, surely the most demanding in the game, had stood virtually unchallenged for 36 years. Lara had 320 to his name. He needed another 46 at the start of play on the third day. I was really anxious, I was very nervous. I played a few terrible shots before that. But I wanted to get there. That was the main thing. And um, when I leveled it, I know uh, if I ever share a, a record with Sagari Sobas, that was great enough for me. And when I passed it, well, it was unbelievable. He's gone for the call. And there it is. Brian Lara has done it. The new world record holder is Brian Charles Lara of Trinidad and Tobago. I've never seen Sir Gary play cricket, but what everyone has told me, he's the greatest all-rounder ever, and some have even said he's the greatest batsman that ever played cricket. And to pass his milestone of 365 was the greatest uh, feeling I've ever had. It's the happiest moment of my life. Well, I just said to him, well done, and hugged him, because um, he's a very nice boy. I have watched him from the time he started, when he first came to Barbados, playing in the Sir Gary Sobers International School Boys Competition. And from that day that I saw him, I was shouting his praise and I was saying to people that he's going to be the best player the West Indies and the, the world has ever seen. And people laughed at me. Well, I think it's probably about the best innings I've ever seen. All told, in two and a half days, he made about six false shots. And this was one of them off the ball, which eventually caused his downfall. For the record, Lara had batted for six minutes short of 13 hours for his 375, facing 536 balls and stroking 45 balls take into account conditions and it wasn't the most testing conditions to play a test match innings the wicket was flat having said that to bat for two and a half days and make a handful of poor shots which he did maybe five or six shots that he'd regret was a phenomenal effort in terms of concentration and technique uh, and yeah I'd stand by the comment that I made at the time your point of view he's a perfect man to break your record well he's a left-hander too <laughs> I don't think many right-handers could play that way. <laughs> oh, really? Well, Lara played several holes of right-handed golf every morning before continuing with his left-handed marathon, bar the last because by then he was too tired. England now had a match to save, as much as anything to prove that their recovery in Barbados hadn't been just a flash in the pan. The West Indies declared on 595 for five. Another ray of hope for the future in that England fought back under extreme pressure. 
Atherton featured in a record stand of 303 with Robin Smith, who finally released all his pent-up frustration. It was nice to see Robin play so well. He's back to his best. I thought it was a super innings, 175. He had some criticism on the rest there from the team manager. And that criticism, as ever, is a, is a constructive criticism. Uh, there's no bigger fans of Robin than myself and Fletch. Uh, but there's times when you have to refocus on what's, what's necessary and what you have to do when you're playing for England. After all the hard work in Barbados and getting the win there, it would have been a disappointment to lose in Antigua and get, go home 4-1. Uh, we felt 3-1 would have been a much fairer reflection of the series as a whole. So we emphasised the need to fight for a draw there, and that's something England hadn't been doing in the last 12, 18 months. And I thought, despite the fact people will say it was a breeze and that there was a flat wicket, I thought it was a hell of a good effort to get a draw there. Both teams made exactly the same score. Another unusual statistic to bring a record-breaking tour to a close. Brian Lara's homecoming in Trinidad was spectacular. A new cricketing world champion had been born. It's going to be the same player. I'm going to start from zero and all my innings. I don't want anyone to compare me with any great player. This is, these are just figures to me. You know, you have a good day, you have a good couple of days, and you get your break a record. But I'm, I'm going to start all over again, and you know, a lot of pressure is going to be on me from the public worldwide. But as I said, I just I've got to take it in stride and hope that everything works out for me. The way his season has already started with Warwickshire suggests that Lara might just be able to handle county cricket. A year ago, Mike Atherton returned from Sri Lanka, deeply concerned about his England future. Now his whole world has been transformed. The West Indies fast bowlers tried to break his spirit and resolve in Jamaica, but he passed the test and emerged all the stronger for it. Many teams fold completely when morale hits rock bottom, but Atherton's fought back. I think he's done very well. I mean, there have been no public dramas, but I think there have been, been the minor ones, the dressing room dramas, which always occur on a tour. And I think Michael's handled them quietly and positively in his own way. And he's shown to me that he can be a very good leader of men. He, he was always likely to be, because he, he's been a leader all his life. But people thought that maybe he wasn't quite hard enough. He's a very tough man, a very tough man indeed. And I think he'll captain England for many years to come. Yeah, I thought he handled the team very very well and um, he, he was able to command respect from the guys I think and I think that is very very important and uh, I well, just like to wish him all the best because you know he's a person that I like and um, I think that he can do a very good job playing. I would say that I was pleased with the response I got from my players um, I felt particularly as the tour went on as I got to know them better and they got to know me better I felt there was a, a good spirit coming through within the team and I felt that at the end even at the end of a long and arduous tour um, you know, there was a hell of a lot of character shown. I'd like to think we can take that through to this summer. Um, and I was pleased with the response that I got, yeah. There's a new regime as cricket starts to replace football on the back pages. Railingworth, the chairman of selectors, has threatened to make changes. And he meets tonight with Atherton and Keith Fletcher, who want to keep faith with those who showed some fight in the all Caribbean. Right, right. The bottom line is that England have won only two tests and lost 11 of their last 15. That situation has to improve. I think there's always pressure when you play for England. Um, the pressure this summer is to win the series because that's what people will be expecting us to do. We didn't have quite that pressure in the West Indies because nobody realistically expected us to come back with a, a one series. But against New Zealand, everybody's going to be expecting us to win the series. I expect us to win the series and therefore there's that pressure, but I think we're good enough to do it. Old Trafford, the theatre of dreams, is the ideal place to start searching for inspiration. disappointing to lose and, and that's not the, the fun memories but I think the spirit within the, the team itself uh, made it for an enjoyable tour and I think that the West Indian crowds and the, their, their general enthusiasm for cricket meant that it was a very special three months for all of us.
Cricket, now on BBC.